very warm welcome everyone to the Singapore Tourism Board Marketing College Masterclass. Launched in 2020, the Masterclass series is a learning experience by the STB Marketing College that is targeted at travel and tourism stakeholders to deep dive into specific marketing topics to drive agile, bold and creative marketing. Continuing on our success from the last year, we have partnered with even more industry players and topic experts to create meaningful and relevant content. So today we are looking at how we brand and build in an endemic world. And we all know that now more than ever, marketing capabilities are essential to enable travel and tourism businesses to traverse opportunities and challenges in our post-pandemic world. We're very pleased today to have with us Daniel Hokuli from LinkedIn. Daniel leads LinkedIn's LMS content solutions team across APAC and China and is currently an active committee lead for the IAB, which is the Interactive, I beg your pardon, Interactive Advertising Bureau in Southeast Asia. And he's a board member of the a Asian Content Marketing Association. At LinkedIn, he actually drives education, consultancy, evangelism, and execution of content and marketing tactics to LinkedIn's premier consumers across, I beg your pardon, premier customers across the region. So today's session will be definitely an engaging one where we will look at awareness, perception and salience and look at how to identify and articulate your brand objectives accurately. In addition, you will learn how to execute and measure an effective brand campaign and look at what best in class branding looks like across the travel and tourism industry. Over to you, Daniel. Well, what an introduction, Delisha. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Hockooley, and I am LinkedIn's manager for the content solutions team across APEC and China. And I'm super excited today to be hosting this STB masterclass. Um, we're going to really talk about how sort of marketers and tourism travel industries are going to build their brands coming out of the pandemic and how you can actually do that on the LinkedIn platform. But before we begin, um, I did want to take a quick pulse check with you guys through Slido. So could everyone please zap this QR code, pull out your phones and zap this QR code. And then I'd love you to answer this question for me. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think about brand building? Give you a couple of seconds to, uh, to zap the code and jump on. Um, and if you go to slido.com um, and uh, you put in the event code of STB Marketing College, that should also take you there too. Okay, cool. We've got some answers coming in. So we've got marketing is the big one. Awareness, consistency. Um, I see creative. I see relationship, connectivity, brand love, long-term investment, good conversation, purpose. You guys are on the money here. There's a lot of great answers here. Personality, you know, brand building takes time. Exactly right. Um, you know, mind share. Mind share is something we're going to be talking quite a lot about today. Top of mind recall, exactly right. We're going to be hitting that too quite a bit. Uh, longevity, emotion. We're going to be talking about emotion as well. There's a lot here, guys. You guys are uh, really on the ball and uh, I think you're going to find this session quite engaging. So if we, um, thank you so much. Um, so if we jump back to the presentation, here's a little bit about how we're going to be talking through the flow of today. We're going to spend some time talking about the state of tourism industry, um, in particular about sort of how marketers showed up during the COVID pandemic and then obviously what's the next phase for us to move into. We'll also deep dive into the concept of brand building and I will share with you some three sort of three core brand building elements, which is awareness, salience and fame. And I've got some examples, some really good, good practices to share with you on these. After that, then we'll talk about content specifically. So we'll go and deep dive and, and share with you three ingredients that really must be present in all pieces of branded orientated content that you publish moving forward. And then finally, we're going to have a look at some measurement. Um, how do you actually measure your brand efforts and campaigns as opposed to your performance marketing? What's the difference between the two? And how can you actually use brand to see growth impact um, and earning share of market? Um, hopefully by the end of this session, there's a couple of things you can come and take away. Number one is sort of a better understanding of the, of what brand marketing is as opposed to performance marketing, some clearer ways on how you can build a brand that is really engaging 
And then secondly, and thirdly, uh, you know, uh, a better understanding on the metrics and the objectives to track your campaigns. So let's start off with though, talking first about some trends, about the world we've been living in in the last few years. I guess it'll come as no surprise, but the pandemic has actually hit the tourism industry harder than most. Um, you know, in fact, you know, this analysis here by Kearney um, shows that COVID-19 was actually the biggest seismic event to hit the travel and tourism industries in the last 20 years. It hit harder than September 11 and harder than the GFC in 2008. And the recovery process is likely to be a slow one. McKinsey reported that tourism isn't likely to return back to pre-pandemic levels until 2023. And I actually think Marriott's post here um, really sums it up nicely about the sentiments about how we're all kind of feeling right now. I know me, I'm stuck in Singapore for nearly two years now, and uh, I'm often asking, will I travel again? But there is light at the end of the tunnel here. You know, economies are starting to rebound, vaccination rates are going up, and we're seeing governments like Singapore's actively pushing towards a new normal. But that said, it's important to recognize that different industries across the pandemic have been affected differently. As the pandemic forces the digitalization of many brick and mortar businesses, what we've actually seen is this profitable purple patch coming out from the technology sectors and the computing industries. They're in hyper growth right now and they're evolving quickly to meet the demands of their, of their services. Other industries like finance and education, they've been affected in different ways. Uh, and, and you know, while they need to digitalize or pivot some of their services, they haven't really been forced to rethink their current modus operandi. And then we have those disruptive businesses. And this is where I think tourism and retail and travel really fits in. Pand the pandemic has really completely upended this industry. And, and in order for us to survive, we must think about evolving. Now, I suspect that many of you see yourselves in this bucket of a disrupted business over the last couple of years. And I do think it's worth looking at how such businesses have acted with their marketing and their budgets in the last 18 months. And actually what pitfalls have arisen because of some of the actions. For many marketing teams, a disrupted business uh, has meant that their marketing has become very reactionary. When the pandemic hit, many brands in tourism uh, stopped their advertising or, and went completely dark. Some paused their marketing for a short period of time, others sliced up their marketing budgets, and others still became much more laser focused on immediate returns. Now, cutting your advertising can make sense for a few reasons. You know, if you're normally in the event space and the mice business, and you're doing a lot of in-person events, and those events suddenly stop, then the events marketing budget then needs to, you know, move to other parts of the business that require more attention. In this way, the advertising budget then can actually appear to be a dispensable luxury uh, because the advertising budget is typically non-fixed and, and often it's seasonal. And so therefore we often think that the money there can be diverted quickly at short notice. And sure, relocating a, relocating a brand's advertising and pocketing that budget in a time of crisis is an easy way to protect net profits. Uh, but, and you know, we, we actually have a term for this because it's so common, it's called milking the brand. However, short-term benefits often cover up a more sinister long-term impact on your brand's market share. On the slide before you is a study done by one of the world's premier marketing research institutions, the Ehrenberg Bass Institute. And just last week, they revealed that when brands stop or pause their advertising for a year or more, sales often decline year on year following that stop. On average, they saw that sales fell 16% in the first year and 25% in the second year once advertising stopped. And so this shows you that one of the worst things we can do during a pandemic or any crisis really is to stop advertising. The longer you pause, the actually the more pain it will compound to you for the future. I'll show you this in another way. Here's an analogy. Let's take this plane to be your brand. And the advertising is, I guess, the fuel of this plane. And so let's pretend that you're flying along and you're spending with your ad budget. Uh, and the green line here is your market share. Now, suddenly the plane runs out of fuel, right? You pause your advertising. And the thing is that the, the market won't plummet. Uh, sorry, your, your plane won't plummet out of the air when it runs out of fuel, it will start to glide. And that's exactly how it works with your advertising too. Your market share just goes on a perpetual downward trajectory and it won't immediately crash. And this is actually what we call that milking of the brand concept. The short-term impact of this is often not noticeable as well. Like lo long-term, you will see it and it will become highly apparent that your brand is perpetually losing market share. But in the immediate short-term, this is all very, very difficult to see. And then so you start to turn your advertising back on as you're coming out of the pandemic or you're increasing it. And But just turning it back on actually doesn't increase your market share back up to the levels it was pre-COVID. Instead, it actually just protects 
the, the, the remaining market share you actually have. And the only way to actually increase it is to actually increase your spending to get back to the levels you were pre-COVID. Now let's rewind 18 months and maybe think about it another way. Let's say you didn't stop your advertising and remained always on that your competitors also at the same time went dark because they didn't start advertising. Well, now you're the, not only maintaining the existing market share, but you're actually slowly and incrementally increasing your market share by staying on always on. Um, this change again is also barely noticeable in the short term, but long term, it could be in the difference for you to be able to catapult and challenge yourself to compete with the much stronger market leaders in your vertical. And while zeroing out on spend is one trend we've seen, some other additional trends we've seen on LinkedIn is COVID fatigue. No doubt you're a little tired of COVID and the restrictions and the uncertainty of endless statistics and the empty messaging of hope from brands. And you aren't alone. On LinkedIn, we are seeing a steady decline in the number of engagements on posts that mention COVID. Members no longer want to hear the bad news. Uh, they're more looking ahead towards the future and they're actually wanting to see change and innovation and brands making a positive social impact moving forward. Indeed, this is some of the content trends that we've noticed in the tourism in in industry in particular. Our platform is very popular with professionals and the content they've been engaging with has been content that demonstrates a company's efforts to do good around things like diversity and inclusion, focusing on mental health and wellness. I mean, after all, it's been a super tough year for all of us. And additionally, news around countries that are creating blue lanes to be more accommodating to tourists and you know how the changing face of business travel and how the rise of digital nomads and remote working has become the new normal. These are some of the, the topics that, are, uh, that LinkedIn members are really interested to, to consume now and we're expecting post pandemic. And as we move out of the pandemic, there are a couple of topics of conversation that we think you should also be looking for around travel and tourism. Here's a couple that we think would be intelligent risks for a new campaign. The first one is VFR. Uh, this is visiting friends and relatives. With the pandemic happening and the borders closing, uh, you know, and, and having various levels of opening stages, it's actually been increasingly difficult for those, for all of us to sort of get in touch with our loved ones. And that includes domestically and globally. It's become a really high priority right across the world. And is your content speaking to that emotional pull of bringing your loved ones together after lockdown? FIT is the free independent travel. And here the drawer is actually talking about destinations where the crowds will always be small. This actually lessens the potential for possible infection of COVID and anything else. And actually these advertising and talking about these small little escapes or these hidden treasures, these things can actually help promote uh, and, you know, uh, promote um, intelligent tourism and, and, and people who are very cautious about the opening up of the world moving forward, wanting to stay away from crowds. And then finally, wellness. The demands of the last two years has really taken our toll on our health. And as we look to emerge from our hibernation, many travelers will be looking to do something more physical or spiritual. Can you incorporate some of these benefits into your next campaign? So that's it for some of the trends that we've noticed and potentially some trends that are moving forward in the travel and tourism industries. But let's talk a little bit about brand building, building your brand post pandemic. I really like this quote from Professor Brian Sharp. He says, if anyone tells you that there is a recipe for making great brand experiences, that there isn't. We've done a lot of research here to see if there is, but no. But what we do know is that it must refresh memory structures, occasionally build new structures, that help people notice the brand and buy it. In other words, your number one goal as a marketer is to make the brand noticed and remembered. The more the brand is seen, the more the brand is noticed and remembered, the more likely it is to be recalled in buying situations. And this is what we call building mental availability. Professor Gemini Romaniuk talks a little bit about mental availability here. She says it's building brand memory structures in the consumer's mind. In the vast majority of buying situations, consumers want to finish as quickly as possible. And mental availability is about making your brand known and easily thought of in those buying situations. So how do we do this? How do we build a memorable travel and tourism brand? Well, it's all about creating content that raises the profile of the brand in the minds of the consumer, whether they are either in the market to buy right now or will be in the market to buy in the future. And there's actually three tiers of maturity around this concept of brand building. The first is awareness. Simply put, does the consumer know you exist? Are they aware of you? 
The second is salience. Does the consumer know you exist and think about you in buying situations? And then finally, fame. Does the consumer think about you all the time? Capitalizing on all three of these is what we call owning the consumer's share of mind. Now, I'll admit the ideas of mental availability and brand building and share of mind are quite abstract ideas. You know, if you're new to marketing or if this is not your full-time role, I might've just introduced you to a whole bunch of new terms. But really, let's think about it as a core, especially at the top end of the funnel, whereas where we want to do is really tell the world about who we are. And we should always be coming back to this question. How will I get my brand noticed and remembered? We tend to think that one of the most important objectives at top end of the funnel is to grow our awareness. And this is true, awareness is important. But when we look at the other two areas of brand building, awareness is actually probably the least valuable metric or goal when it comes to winning share of mind. If a brand has high awareness, it just basically means that people knows it exists. Your content supports this, but it actually doesn't drive any action. Truth is, you don't want consumers just to be aware of you. What you really want is consumers to think about you in those buying situations. A case in point, we're all aware of these brands, Hilton, Expedia, Budget. These brands have really strong awareness. But just because we know the Hilton name, it doesn't mean that we're going to be renting a room and staying at the Hilton the next time we travel. And here's the problem with focusing just on awareness. Aided and unaided awareness tests can tell you a lot about your brand's recognition in the market, but not really much about whether or not your brand is being considered as the vendor for choice. And this is where brand salience comes in. Brand salience is much more about, it's much more important than brand awareness. If your brand has high salience, it means the brand gets thought of more easily in those buying situations. Brands with a greater degree of salience come to the consumer's mind more strongly and actually influencing that buyer's choice. One little sidebar about salience is that it's important to acknowledge that travel consumers are promiscuous. We work hard to maintain loyalty programs and double down on quality of customer service. And even when you get really good at these elements, this is no guarantee that that customer will come back and become a repeat customer. I give you a real world anecdote uh, from my own self. And I think many of you probably can relate to this. I live in Singapore and pre pandemic, I used to visit the island of Bintown pretty regularly. Uh, which is just off the coast of Singapore. But rarely did I stay in the same hotel. Now, there are many great hotels in Bintan, and the experiences that I had with most of them were really five-star. But I don't stay there because when I travel, I'm in an explorer's mindset, and that includes exploring new places to stay. I'm a promiscuous travel buyer, and perhaps you are too. And for a travel brand then, what really matters here is that you are salient to as many people as possible not just those on your loyalty or club lists. And whether that, and whether it's with a, uh, a loyal customer or with a promiscuous customer, the key to attracting both is for your brand to become to their mind quickly. And for the most salient brands, these ones are more often remembered and talked about outside of buying situations as well. And these are who we call famous brands. These are brands that you think about all the time, even when you don't actually know it. And some good ways to identify a famous brand is if their name or becomes a verb or synonymous with the industry itself. For example, when someone says, hey, why don't you just Google this? Or why don't you Airbnb it? Or why don't you get me a Band-Aid rather than a plastic strip? Of course, not every brand will obtain this fame status, and it really shouldn't be the objective for most brands, especially if you're challenging a market leader. But famous brands are famous because they have many buyers, not loyal buyers. And, and as long as people are both aware of your brand and it's salient enough to be thought of in buying situations, then you are doing the right things in your marketing. Now you might've noticed that we're not really talking anything about the middle funnel, like that consideration phase or the bottom funnel, the action and the conversion phases. This is because in these areas, brand building isn't really the most effective area to leverage. That said, these areas are super important to highlight for a couple of reasons. These sections is where you're really trying to earn the customer's share of wallet not the share of mind as you are with brand building. And at the mid and the bottom funnel, you're serving content that really leans heavily into the work that you've done at the top end of the funnel, at the, at the share of mind brand building phase. In the mid funnel, you actually share content like your thought leadership, your case studies, your testimonials, your product demonstrations. And at the bottom funnel, you're getting very promotional orientated, right? These are your sales, your discounts, your promotions. These are content assets meant to convert the customer to buy more, to buy again, or to buy now. And the content you serve 
lower at the funnel should really be more focused on audiences that we would call in market buyers, people who are in the market to buy now or in the next few months. But generally these people are a very, very small percentage of your total share of market. And if you haven't done enough really to win their share of mind at the top, and, not, and, they're not, and your brand is not super familiar or salient with them, then you're really going to be struggling to be effective at the bottom end of the funnel to convert their share of wallet. Okay, so let's, let's pull ourselves back up to the funnel again. Let's talk again about brand building. Now, if the number one purpose of a marketing team then is to make the brand noticed and remembered, what do we need to do to make this a reality? Well, here are some three ingredients for us to focus on. Professor Sharp said that there was actually no recipe for great brand experiences, but there are some ingredients, and these three are probably the most important. One is creativity, the second is emotional messaging, and the last one is distinctive consistency. Now it's up to you to make that recipe work for you with these ingredients, and the quality of that recipe is really dependent on the skills of you and your team and your creative partners. But let's look at each one. The first ingredient is creativity. It's an interesting one, and while we all recognize that creativity is essential in a good campaign, it's actually often the ingredient we most overlook. And this, in fact, can be very dangerous, because creativity is perhaps the single most important element in a marketing campaign that dictates its success. This sounds like an exaggeration, but it's actually backed up with data. In 2017, Nielsen looked at the core elements of ad effectiveness and found that the quality of the creative contributed to nearly half of the total sales contribution within a campaign. Do not neglect creativity. It's a lost art in a marketing team and in agencies today, but when it works, it works better than anything else that you can do in your campaign. Now, creativity is a super broad word. What are we actually meaning here when we talk about creativity? Well, it's a couple of things. It's original content, it's different content, and it's often unexpected content. In fact, some of the most famous campaigns are original. They're different and they're unexpected. Many of them don't make sense and some of them are downright weird. Let's think about the old Spice Guy ads or the, this gorilla playing the drums for Cadbury or the gecko mascot for the insurance company Geico. But it's this weirdness, this abstractness that makes it truly different content and also then makes it more memorable. And in some ways, focusing on being unexpected can seem counterintuitive. You know, as marketers, the natural order of things dictates that we research our audience, that we research our markets and look at trends and find out what's relevant to them and the great content around relevance. And this approach is helpful when you're at the bottom end of the funnel trying to win that share of wallet because you're creating white papers and case studies and how-tos, but not really when you're trying to win share of mind. And the main reason why using data and relevance and logic around brand building fails is that your competitors are actually doing the same thing when it comes to this. They're also looking at the same data. They're following the same industry trends. They're targeting the same audience. And when you're all creating the same content based on the same information, using the same iStock images, you all look the same. And thus the, you can really commit that number one cardinal sin as a marketer, which is to be memorable, to make your brand stand out. And brand content is all about your brand. It's not about the industry trends. It's not so much about the audience either. If we look at this Cadbury ad, for example, right? It's likely that Cadbury in that board meeting had all the data and the audience analysis and the marketing trends. But let's imagine what it was like to pitch this ad of a gorilla playing the drums in that meeting. And the one thing to me is it seems very clear that they did something that many marketers don't do is they probably looked at that data, they acknowledged it, and then they parked it. And then they asked themselves a simple question. Will people remember this ad? Create, thinking creatively is super important. Visit Singapore is a great example of this, of, of them actually trying something different. You know, uh, you know, the, the, the mice business has been severely affected by the pandemic and holding, and, you know, and so they're holding the key message here of them being ready to reopen up, to hold in-person and human events. The interesting thing here that they chose to market was they chose to market it without humans, but instead with robots. This is a creative approach that reinforces that they're doing innovative solutions and that they're cutting edge and that they're ready to cater to holding events in Singapore again. And interestingly, this is actually one of the most engaged posts in the tourism industry in Asia on LinkedIn in the last 12 months. On digital, viral content is unexpected content. Nearly all viral content on social media has one thing in common, which is something unexpected happens in the video. We remember it because it's so different from anything else that we've ever seen. 
A great example of this is Tourism Australia's most memorable campaign a few years back. You know, we'd start the usual beaches and the beautiful landscape shots of the outback and kangaroos, but it became famous for a single word that was said. A girl on the beach turned to the camera and said, where the bloody hell are you? And that's what made it so memorable. It wasn't the beautiful beaches and the imagery. It was actually swore in the campaign. It was unexpected and it was, it was controversial. And it was one of Tourism Australia's most successful campaigns ever. And unexpectedness can come in other forms as well. Here's a great example of a high-performing post on LinkedIn from Air New Zealand. It's of their CEO in the middle of the pandemic, working the aisles on a plane and serving customers. Now, this is something that is both positive and also unexpected to see from a leader. Yet during the pandemic, it's become important for business leaders to be visible, to also be seen to be doing something and to be showing empathy. Posts like this are far more powerful for a brand than any press release or any quote from a CEO talking about us all being in it together. This CEO here is walking the walk, not just talking the talk. And Tourism New Zealand's current campaign is also another great example of creative and memorable creative. Not because it's unexpected, but because it's funny. This is a man running around the country, ensuring that tourists are not taking cliched Instagram posts. Importantly, it's an ad that is only seen, the only need to really see once to remember it. And it's all, that's because it's super memorable. It is the most shared post on Tourism New Zealand's account since 2017. And what I really love about this is that he's actually encouraging tourists to create original content the same way as I'm encouraging you to do the same. Now, one thing you may notice about that Tourism New Zealand ad is that the content makes you feel something. It appeals to your emotional brain, not your rational. And that's because emotional content experiences are far more powerful than the rational ones, especially at the top end of the funnel. And that's generally where we think emotional content should sit. The truth is, though, the decisions that are made by people are both rational and emotional at the same time. Travelers, whether they're recreational or business travelers, are never 100% emotional and 100% rational. And your content needs to address both of those brains. As marketers, we generally find it much easier creating rational content than emotional. So here's an exercise that may help you inject more emotion into your next campaign. It's called the benefits ladder. And it's a hierarchy of benefits, starting from your product's features, then talking about its functional benefits, and then finally the emotional benefit it delivers. As marketers, we understand well how to communicate our product's features and services through our content. We are perhaps also experts at articulating the functional benefits. What's the value the customer sees from the product? But in your next campaign, I challenge you to go one step higher and to think about that emotional impact. Your product or service is going to be delivering on an emotional level. As you are working on the creative, ask yourself and your team the simple question. In this campaign, are we communicating a functional benefit here or are we communicating an emotional benefit? This post on the left is from Sydney airports during the pandemic. And it's a great example. The airport feature is really that it's a transport hub. Its functional benefit of an airport is that it will help you get to your destination. But the ad that they chose to run with was really that emotional benefit, which is about bringing families and loved ones together. And that this message was extremely strong on LinkedIn and was one of the reasons why it earned them strong viral engagement on our platform. Here's some other great examples of emotional content versus rational. On the left, Hyatt Hotels does everything right with this super slick video communicating the functional benefits of their hotel, the cocktails, the snacks, the atmosphere, but on the right, we have two very extraordinary posts that lead with emotion. The first is Southwest Airlines, and this is the most engaged post on LinkedIn for the tourism industry in the last 12 months. It's nothing super flashy. It's just a bunch of photos and a really cool story. And the story is about a couple that met by chance sitting next to each other on the Southwest flight. They then got engaged and married on other flights. And the second post here is from Indigo, celebrating the birth of a baby during the pandemic on one of their airlines. Now, while the engagement on the rational post here from Hyatt received hundreds of engagements. The two emotional posts got engagements in the tens of thousands. And here are two other similar posts, both declaring that they're open for business, but one, the Hilton, runs with the functional benefits of their wonderful hotels, while Shangri-La latched onto the emotional message of the family staycation. Now you may be thinking, you know, this guy's from LinkedIn and, and, and LinkedIn's a professional platform for finding work and talking about business. The content needs to be more rational than emotional. And look, there's a place for rational content on LinkedIn, definitely. And I would argue that where it sits is largely at the bottom end of the funnel. 
when you're really making the case to go with you as the vendor for choice. But when we think about brand and we think about how we're just trying to capture attention and build memories, does emotional content belong on LinkedIn? The answer is unequivocally yes. Our members are human and content with an element of humanity always works better on LinkedIn than any content that's going to be dry or formal or business orientated. Don't forget that LinkedIn is a social platform, you know, where things like humble bragging is a very much loved feature that you will see in the feed. Internally, our data science team actually looked at the many types of content that we find on LinkedIn and found that content that talks about personal experiences, personal successes at work, congratulatory posts and motivational content, these posts really trumped any content around finding a job or news about the industry or thought leadership. Even on LinkedIn, emotion done authentically can get you the attention and the recognition you deserve. And the final ingredient for a great brand campaign is ensuring that content looks like your brand and not your competitors. And this is what we call distinctive consistency. I'm going to play a game with you here. Here's an example. I blanked out the names and references of these hospitality chains on these LinkedIn posts. Can anyone correctly guess which hotel created these posts? Hard, right? Well, in actual fact, it's a trick question because it wasn't just one hotel, but actually six different hotels uh, that were all publishing very similar looking content. And here we as marketers are fighting our own pandemic internally. It's one around the same sameness of content that we see. Remember, the goal of your content is to make your brand memorable, make it stand out. This is difficult to do when your content looks the same as everyone else in the industry. We've become a collection of marketers very much obsessed with copying case studies and best practices of our competitors rather than stepping out of our own shadows and, and, and doing something original and creative. The biggest sin a marketer can make is to create content experiences that nobody remembers. Or worse still, people remember it, but they attribute it to the bigger brand in the industry, right? Not you, but your competitor. As gatekeepers for your brand's look, its design, its purpose and field, you must be leveraging your brand's distinctive assets at every possible opportunity. And if you're unfamiliar with this term, distinctive brand assets, here's a quick game to demonstrate what I mean. Tell me if you recognize the brand just from these assets that appear. Let's start with the logo. Do you guys uh, uh, know which logo or which brand has this logo? Well, if you said Singapore Airlines, you'd be correct there. What about these colors? Do you recognize these colors? They look like FedEx, right? How about this font? This is a difficult one here, but um, it'd be Airbnb. What about this tagline? If you're in the hospitality space in the hotel industry, maybe you might recognize this tagline. It's from the Mandarin Oriental. How about this logo or this mascot? Which brand has this? TripAdvisor. And what about this yellow stripe on the green background? If you recognize this from the logo of Europe car, you'd be correct there. See how easy it is to recognize a brand just by a color palette, a font, or a mascot. Each one of these helps the brand become memorable and aids in the brand being noticed. There's no message here. There's no brand purpose here at all. There's just strong, recognizable assets that you should be using in every single piece of content and creative that you publish. Here's a couple of examples. Emirate has their iconic color red, as well as the iconic headdress of their flight attendants, which they use in much of their content. Agoda has the Agojis. These are part of their logo, the dots in their logo, but now they have faces and they appear in every type of content, whether it's them celebrating Chinese New Year or employing employer branding content or uh, their efforts to, to talk about their online transactions and, and how they're keeping those secure. And a core hotels leads with their logo at the top of every post and is consistent framing of every image. It doesn't matter what the image is talking about, right? It doesn't matter if it's a hotel feature, a festival, a business travel, a destination, a room, a, a global wellness day. Their branding is consistent, even if the messaging is different. Now, what's the benefit of doing this? Well, it's simple pattern recognition from the consumer's mind. Remember, you want to build memories and repeating consistent looks helps breed familiarity and quicker recognition. When they see that styling, that logo, that jingle, that mascot, it's just another element adding to it, assist in their ad recall around your brand. Secondly, these assets are iconically yours. It's the look that you can own. It's part of your DNA. It stands for who you are as a brand. You need to carve that niche out for yourself. And in every piece of content, you need to tell people about it. You need to ensure your logo's there, your icon, your slogan appears, colors are there, living and moving within every content you create. And while I focused on the uniqueness of how a brand should look, Similar, it should also be around distinctiveness applied to what you say. 
The Mandarin Oriental here markets two distinctive features of their hotels. One is their silent night spa treatments and meditations. And the second is showcasing their employees with unique talents, such as their barber, Stephen Wan, who's a Tai Chi master. Okay, so we've discussed brand efforts, how they can generate memories, win share of mind, focusing on awareness, salience, and fame. And we've also explored three ingredients that you can use into your content to support building memories. And this is creativity, emotional messaging, and then distinctive brand assets. Well, now we're into the final section of how we can actually identify brand objectives and measure them effectively. And when we talk about measurement of brand, particularly on social media, it's important to understand the differences between metrics that signal the need to optimize a campaign and improve creative, and those signals that actually demonstrate brand impact and growth into your share of market. Looking at it this way, your, optimize, your optimization metrics are super important, but they're also more real time. These include the vanity metrics like impressions and engagement and views and clicks. Such actions don't signal much about how salient or famous your brand is. They just merely inform you about whether or not the content published now is, is resonating with the target audience that you sent it to. If you're not getting the clicks or the views that you need, then what you need to do is optimize your campaign. And that might include optimizing the content, or optimizing the targeting, or even your budget. Performance metrics, on the other hand, require a little bit more thinking and long-term setup to track effectively. These signals measure the macro impact of your brand efforts right across the market and actually should light up to an indicating factors on how much market share you are winning from your competitors. These include tracking things like awareness through aided and unaided brand recall call surveys. Looking at share of search analysis, this is really sort of monitoring trends of how many brand mentions you're getting and how many people are searching for your brand on Google post campaign. And more important, and the most important one really is extra share of voice, ESOV. This to date is the most important brand metric and the only one that has been proven as the core leading indicator to indicate market share growth. So what is extra share of voice, ESOV? Well, in general, it's the difference between how much market share you have versus how much share of voice you have. And share of voice is really your advertising and your communications and your PR, your communications area. The goal is to always actually have higher share of voice, higher communications than your market share in the market. So if you are a marketer of a challenger hospitality brand and your market share is 20%, in order for you to grow that market share, you need to have a share of voice that's greater than 20% in the market. And speaking in really rough terms, if you are successful at maintaining 10% extra share of voice over your market share, you actually stand to win around 1% more market share from your competitors. And in some verticals, winning just 1% more market share can actually deliver hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars in extra revenue. On the flip side, if you cut your advertising spending, your share of voice then gets cut as well, and it will shrink. And those brands that have a smaller share of voice than their actual market share are the brands that over time will struggle to maintain their market share and will shrink. So what's the best way to grow our share of voice and eventually our market share? Well, part of it is spending more on advertising and part of it is always being always on. Remember the analogy I used of the plane perpetually falling earlier in the session? That's something you want to avoid. And even with a limited budget, what we can actually do is ensure that you maintain a consistent share of voice and a consistent present by smart spending. Here's an example. We have a client here who was spending $100,000, oh, sorry, $10,000 a month on our LinkedIn and two big purse here in the top left-hand corner. You can see the spikes. And underneath them, you can actually see that their engagement rate was quite low and it was also spiked engagement, right? And then they went dark in each time here. Well, in the next month, across you know late February to early March into April, they chose to be always on instead. Same budget of 10K a month, but instead what they decided to do now was to spend it more consistently, $500 a day, for example. And what they actually saw was that their engagement became far more consistent as well over time and rose higher to anything they did with the big spike. Now, the big issue we often have here is that content creation takes time and we have a quarter to publish our content out or a seasonal basis. And over that quarter, the first month is usually taken up by creating content. And then we, we back end our spending to the final month or to the last couple of a uh, couple of weeks or so to get all of that content out before the next quarter. The funny thing is you aren't alone when you do that. 
your your competitors are doing the same thing because of their system of content creation to content spending. And when that happens, that actually incredibly rises the price of that target audience and your CPC because you're all competing for the same audience at the same time. Spreading out your spending, not spending more, but spreading it out, being always on, being flatter in terms of your spending and more intelligent about it can actually lead to better results. Let's talk a little bit more about some good practices as we close up here before we get into Q&A. Here's some quick tips for LinkedIn specifically. Video, live, and stories. Uh, for those who are comfortable on camera, video, LinkedIn Live, and Stories uh, offer some really great bite-sized uh, uh, and, and some more substantive avenues for creating engaging and interesting content. Like Stories and other platforms like Instagram, Stories on LinkedIn are designed to be fleeting and ephemeral. They're generally more casual and fun, but they can also be great for teasing out more permanent long-form content, such as a blog post or um, a larger campaign. And so publishing a story to let people know that you've published something else is, is a really good way to leverage this format. Live is also a really great forum to hold things like real-time Q&A with the brand or hosting interviews and conversations with peers or other industry thought leaders in travel and tourism. Steam, you know, streaming a, a talk from a travel event uh, or a conference is also another great way to use this, this content format. And think of beyond the text update and the image update on LinkedIn as well. For example, on the left here, you see a video of a podcast. So if you have a podcast, convert it to a video format the way EY have done here. Make sure it comes with subtitles. 85% of videos on LinkedIn are viewed in silence. So you must always, as best practice, put subtitles in and leverage them that way. The other one that works really great for engagement on LinkedIn is polls. Start asking questions. Antal International, an Italian travel brand here, is asking questions about how people manage to switch off during their holidays. These are really great vessels to engage on LinkedIn members. And then finally on hashtags. On LinkedIn, you know, hashtags are a really great source to stay connected on topical stuff. And there's two ways to sort of leverage hashtags. One, leverage your generic hashtags. These are things like hashtag travel, hashtag tourism, hashtag hotels. Um, with these generic ones, you should kind of see sort of a click-through gain of around an, an additional 3% and maybe a viral action of around 1.5%. It's not something I would rely on organically for the success of your campaign. No campaign is going to go well because of hashtags, but it will give you a small incremental lift in terms of reach and engagement. That said, they're very generic. And so, you know, there's only so much you can do there. And I would encourage you only really to use one to three hashtags in a post. The other type of hashtag is actually the more specific hashtag, something that maybe has your campaign name in there or your brand name in there. You know, you know hashtag Hilton Talks or something, right? Here, you can actually create content series because on LinkedIn, you can actually subscribe to specific hashtags and say you have an eight part content series or a talking series or a podcast series that wants to come out, own that hashtag and then get people to subscribe to that. So they get updates of when the next posting happens via the hashtag. Okay, closing up now in short, um, three key areas that you can have immediate impact today on what you can do. The first one is to clearly define your brand objectives. Move away from performance marketing. I mean, don't move away. Keep doing that as well. But add that, add that upper layer, upper funnel, brand marketing and the differences between them into your campaigns. Think about the differences between the, those optimization and performance metrics that you will track with your brand moving forward. Have you calculated your share of market? Have you calculated your share of voice in the market? Try calculating those. And then also after your next campaign, run an ad or brand recall survey to get a good understanding of, of whether or not your brand is memorable and that campaign worked. Secondly, audit your current branded content. So before your next campaign, ask these questions. Is the content we're putting out original, creative, and unexpected? Is it gonna capture attention? Does it communicate an emotional benefit? Have we used the benefits ladder to move beyond the functional? Does it contain two or more of our own brand's distinctive assets in it? so that people, when they see this ad and they laugh at it or they love it, the emotion about it, then they can also tie it to our brand. And secondly, for scale, is this successful campaign easily replicable? Can we run this campaign every year or can we make tweaks to it every quarter and keep it going? And finally, keep advertising. I've harped on this a bit, but when you stop your advertising, it's actually one of the most harmful things you can do for your brand building. So if you stay always on, especially during a time of crisis, you are going to accelerate your brand building, which will hopefully influence your market share down the track. 
And that's it for me, guys. I will uh, throw it back to the team to open it up for some Q&A. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you, Daniel, for that great presentation. Lots of food for thought on this Wednesday. Uh, you talked a little bit about the fact that emotional or more emotive content, personal content, actually uh, gets us more interaction and more engagement. And one of our questions that we have coming through is, do you see LinkedIn moving into more of a social platform where it has traditionally been a business or professional platform? And what is LinkedIn doing to make the platform more social friendly? Yeah, definitely. Um, the answer to that is yes. Uh, LinkedIn is moving very quickly in towards a mobile social aspect of the platform. I think when people uh, originally open up a LinkedIn account, the, uh, they open it up not because they want to see content, but because they're looking for a job, right? And the basis of why you sign up for LinkedIn in the first place is to look for employment and for work. That will always be the core DNA of LinkedIn. But there's a couple of things that we're definitely doing that are going to make the platform more engaging on the content side. First off is we're encouraging um, creators to come back onto the platform and to, to work on the platform. We've actually got this new mode called creator mode. And some of you might've actually see this when you go into your LinkedIn profile, it might ask you to create creator mode. Really what this does is it changes your connect button to follow. And so now you can build a following and you don't actually always have to connect with somebody on LinkedIn anymore. You can still do that. But what we really encourage is that you curate your connections feed because that's what you will see. But if you're creating really good content and you're a great content creator, then having people follow you is actually, and growing that audience of, of your reach and your influence is actually the core purpose of it. So that's one thing. The second thing we're actually looking at doing too is actually where we're thinking about experimenting with a separate feed, which is really going to be heavily editorial based. And so here um, for brands, it's probably not going to be the most relevant right now, but it's more going to be like a, uh, business orientated, um, and an informal, uh, uh, sorry, a very formal sort of, um, newspaper-esque style feed where you can catch up with proper business news, a Bloomberg style, uh, reports on the shares and things like that, where we're moving into that space. Whereas the, the regular social feed will also be there. So you can actually now choose between different types of content that you want to see. Um, thirdly is we're launching a whole bunch of new products, um, you know, more live streaming and helping you with virtual events, putting content in that way. I'm also experimenting with different types of other content formats that are going to be unique to the LinkedIn platform. Um, so there's a lot happening in that space. So watch it over the next 12 months or so. It's a very, very different LinkedIn uh, post-pandemic to, to pre-pandemic. And we've put a lot of effort into changing how people use our platform moving forward. Thank you, Daniel. A uh, great segue to that is um, a more personal question, if you will, from, from the audience. What is your personal favorite LinkedIn post that you've seen from a company that is targeting a potential employee? Oof. There are a <laughs> lot of good ones. Potential employees. Okay, there's an old video that I, I really loved, and it was from SodaStream. It's a really weird one, really weird brand, but SodaStream put out an employer branding video where their CEO was walking around. I'll see if I can find it and share it uh, for you guys post chat. Um, but uh, he, he walked around um, his office and he um, was cracking jokes the entire time uh, and um, his employees were getting involved and they actually had uh, the mountain from Game of Thrones, the big guy. Uh, he was also in there as, as part of like a, a sort of, a, I guess, sort of a, an influence or a celebrity hook. And it was incredibly funny. It was incredibly entertaining. It was well produced. It was a really, really great place that really showed how great SodaStream would be for it as, as an employee to work for that brand. Um, let me see if I can dig it up. It's an old video, probably from like 2016, 17, but it's still one of my favorites. Yeah, so really, I, I think what un underscores that statement is, is the fact that authenticity is actually key to catching those eyeballs, you know, giving you an insight to the culture and then getting people on board. But it was creative, um, which is, it used emotion, it, and, and also, it, you know, it leveraged the right employees. There was that authenticity there. It was really, really great. Nice, which is a great segue to another question, which is, in order to be always on, what is a good good posting frequency are there principles or best in class practices for always on content to drive engagement instead of just shouting about very similar content 
Yeah. So I talked a little bit about um, leveling off your spending, right? Smarter spending. Um, don't backload your quarters with all your spending in order to get all the inventory and your marketing budget out, right? This actually is something that I think every brand really struggles with. Um, and it's really about making sure that your operational content creation focus is there. And often the advantage of publishing early is that you're in there before your competitors are, so you potentially have a bigger chance of owning more share of voice. Um, but on LinkedIn, one of the things that we, we've also noticed is in terms of posting frequency and not so much for brands, but if we're thinking about organic posting, either for members or brands posting organically, my recommendation would be to be publishing once a day, every day, including the weekends. Publishing any more than that, um, the algorithm will start to think about you spamming and will we'll probably lower your reach. Um, publishing less than that, I think then you're sort of the same thing, like you're sort of not training the algorithm enough to revisit and, and, and support gro your growth. So publishing once a day, every day organically is a really great way to do it. With paid, it's a bit different, right? Because paid, um, the inventory only gets spent when the audience is on the platform, right? When we actually show you the content. So it really depends on how engaged your audiences are uh, to how quickly that money will be spent. Um, and so I guess sort of when I think about like, is there a better time to post in the mornings, afternoons, that kind of thing, I don't have a preference. Um, I, I obviously, you know, if you're publishing in, in Singapore and it's midnight Singapore with paid, it's not so much of a big deal because it'll, it'll show when they log in, but with organic, probably not the best time to post. I would probably post sort of around the midday, 10 AM is usually a good time as well. But posting frequencies about port and budget management, um, good operations and, uh, and, and regular cadence. Indeed. Um, this is the next question is actually really around that um, for companies with limited resources, which element in brand building out of unexpected creative, distinctive consistency and emotional storytelling should we prioritize and why? I think you should do all of them at the same time. <laughs> and, and I actually think like the reason why I talked about these specific elements is because big brands do them, but small brands can do them as well. These are completely achievable. You know, if you look at sort of, you know, creativity, it, it comes from everybody's head, right? The IP of your quality of your team, uh, it can, a small brand can have just an awesome idea as a big brand can. Uh, the same thing when it comes to sort of distinctive brand assets, leveraging them smartly is just as consistent and consistently is just as important for a big brand as it is for a small brand. Uh, emotional storytelling, again, uh, a small brand can do that way better than a big brand as well, right? So all three of these elements, are super important and super achievable for a smaller brand. Um, if I had to prioritize one, I, I think it's hard to go past that stat that 50% of your campaign performance is based on how good quality your creative is. And so um, the, the, the problem is though, that if you don't have a logo at the end of that awesome creative, then people aren't gonna know who created it, right? And obviously you don't want them to really engage with that massively without having that distinctive brand asset with it. But I would have to say, Creative is super, super important. And because we all suck at it generally, um, this is a uh, this is a, an area that even just being mediocre at good creative will accelerate you massively forward. So investing in creative would probably be my preference, but do them all. You have to, and you can. Indeed, um, there's a cheeky question that we have um, really in terms of the use of humor. So how important would you say the use of humor is in creating that emotional co connection and being distinctive? Humor is massively important. In fact, I would probably say it's one of the most important emotions you can leverage. Um, but it's hard to do, right? It's hard to do comedy very well. Not everyone can do it. And there's a fine line in comedy that you have to walk when it comes to what's acceptable for certain audiences and what's not. And also there's very dark comedy you can play as well, right? And that's something also that can work. Um, it's definitely worth trying, uh, but what it does take to do humor really well is, um, takes a bold team. It takes a bold brand to step out of the line and to do something that, um, could be controversial in terms of the way the humor is delivered or, or, or received. So, you know, make sure I, I do encourage brands not to play safe because safe turns of vanilla content, vanilla content doesn't achieve impact. And you've just wasted everybody's time, the audiences and yours in creating it. So taking risks is an important element that marketers need to do and being brave. And to do that well, um, you need to be able to expertly walk that line of what's controversial and what's humorous and what's not. But I definitely play with it. I love humor. Um, humorous content often is stuff that goes viral very easily as well, especially when a brand does it super well. 
couple of uh, questions before we conclude the Q&A session. They're heating up, so please get your questions in there. Um, you talked about creative thinking and, and how, you know, a great creative is, is really what captures your eyeballs. Um, so any tips on how to start creative thinking and to jumpstart our creative agency when they're not able to give us creative ideas? Well, um, the, the, a good brief helps, um, you know, yeah. and, and that's one of the things there. I think when you have a really good understanding of the type of message you're going to put in and you're briefing your agency really well, that actually helps them come up with the creative ideas. Um, you know, brainstorming's a, a way to do it. Um, I often like that idea of looking at all the data and then flipping it, right? So looking at all everything that the data is telling us to do, what our audiences want to see, what they want to hear, what they what they engage with, what the trends are saying, and then just go, that's great. I'm acknowledging it, but now I'm going to actually think about something completely different. And then certain words are not allowed to be said then, right? We all know that the trend for tourism is is you know coming back on. Well, what happens if we don't talk about that? What happens if we talk about something else? And it's not to say to ignore that stuff. Obviously, I like I said, I think that sort of stuff around the data works super powerful when it's the mid and bottom funnel through your thought leadership and through your corporate social responsibility posts and through your promotional advertising. But in brand building, you want to be as quirky and as weird and as unexpected as, as possible. Um, and, and that's, you know, and then being able to replicate that as effectively as well. And, and telling the agency and really pushing them on that and saying like, I don't want you to, you to come and present with me with any data on what we should be doing. I want you to go with no data. I just want to hear pure creativity. What can you produce? And sort of challenge them on that as well and sort of see what they can come back with. Yeah, so it starts with a good brief, change up the way that you engage and really then, you know, let the juices flow and not be uh, help beholden to the data or the statistics that you have. Yeah, um, yeah. Last don't let the data dictate the idea, do the other way around. Yeah. Indeed. Last question that we'll take um, is really on ROI. What is a reasonable timeline for brands to work on before evaluating for success on optimization metrics and performance metrics, especially if brands are just starting to build their presence on social media? Yeah, so so like, like advertising in general, it should always be always on in your measurement as well. And there's a couple of stages you can do around say a campaign per se. Uh, brand is long-term. That's the first thing. So if you're expecting to see immediate return on a brand campaign, you're not going to see it. It'd be very, very rare. And what you would maybe even then see was a huge spike on something like share of search, and then you'll see it decline again. And you'll never be able to maintain that all the way across. So a couple of things you need to think about is the first is your optimization metrics are real time and immediate. Your vanity metrics, your clicks, your views, these are important to measure and to, and to monitor to help make sure that the campaign is as optimized as possible. And you can do them today um, during the campaign or just after the campaign to measure those. A little bit further after the campaign, what I would then look at doing is something like an ad recall survey or a brand lift study or something like that, um, where the campaign's ended, you're letting something obviously take its place to run in, but then you want to maybe go revisit that campaign and see if the audience still remembers it. And so maybe a month after or six months after, you might run a quick ad, ad effectives a study or a, or a brand list survey and ask them whether or not they can attribute some of those campaign elements to your brand and whether or not they remember them. Um, so about six months there and then, you know, longer brand building. So extra share of voice, for example, I'm trying to measure that. My higher recommendation is for you to visit that every year. It's a big annual exercise where you maybe spend three weeks with maybe a research company researching your brand lift, researching your extra share of voice, researching the impact you've had on your share of market uh, 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 on an annual basis every single year to help you prove a that marketing works for the business, right? So you can get more budget to spend the next year and to show you the incremental impact it's had because brand building, of course, doesn't show you immediate returns. And when it doesn't show you immediate returns, um, it's very hard to tell the CFO or the CEO that you're doing a good job. And so having this understanding that we're going to see results of this in a year and we will measure them and we'll show you how this effort up front now was actually paying its dividends later is something I think you should do it. But in the meantime, that casual optimization reporting to tell you whether that campaign is running well right now is good enough for a CFO. The, the brand health and the ad effect studies and the, and the, and the, the quantitative surveys uh, around aided and unaided awareness every six months or so, again, nothing, something else to sort of tell the board that, that, that there's a good job doing. So 
it's always on and there's different stages that I would lever, le leverage with, with brand building. Thank you, Daniel. Market share is what um, you that want was... to win. That's the truth. So if you, if you can show that you're Thank making you. impact on market share, that's, the, that's, the, that's going to make everybody in the business happy. Thank you, Daniel. That was a lot to take in and lots of great advice. Um, the full spectrum from how to develop more creative ideas to what really works from a content perspective to really how to continually measure, especially when you know we're in it for the long term as well. Any last thoughts from you before we wrap this up? Um, if there's anybody with that, any more questions, you can, of course, hit me up on LinkedIn um, uh, and, and find me there. I'm more than happy. Just um, shoot me a message and I'm more than happy to... Uh, to try and answer them for you. But thank you for, for the time. It was awesome to be here. Thank you so much. And we loved having you here as well. I'm sure this will not be the end of our LinkedIn conversations and many more conversations will come. So thank you everyone for joining us today on the STB Marketing College Masterclass Series. And of course, your feedback is very important to us. Um, there is the QR code on the screen where you can scan and we look forward to hearing from you on the content as well as any additional ideas that you may have. And as Daniel mentioned, we'll see you on LinkedIn. Thank you everyone and have a great day ahead.